Welcome, one and all, to the mystical world of Felbar. Adventures abound throughout this realm, and we appreciate the opportunity to regale you with some stories from these trails. These accounts are all based on actual RPG experiences that occurred within Adventures in Felbar. Some of these tales may be for mature audiences, while others may be for very immature audiences. We now present the sage Mikas Tumo from Tamel, also known as as the Bard of Philbar. Welcome to session Fartook-16. In our last episode, our party barely survived an encounter with a wanted criminal, Lothar Metal. Despite everyone being injured, the man was captured and his stash of stolen goods was discovered. Scotty, the missing dog, was also located and the party has opted to get out of the sewers having had enough for one day. We rejoin them in a small tunnel leading up to the streets. Put your back into it, yelled out Walby O'Toole, which garnered an angry glance from Fargus Stoutheart. He pointed out that he was considering using the halfling as leverage on the grate, which silenced the small rogue quickly. The human male began to smash into the grate with all his strength, and after several attempts, vanquished the grate. Knocking it off its settings, the metal object flew through the air a short distance and clattered onto the cobblestone street above. Moonlight began to pour into the gap and Fargus sighed heavily. Motioning to Lady Irena, the ranger helped her out of the access drain and up onto the street. He turned to help the cleric when a HO THERE was heard, along with a clatter of booted feet. The party did not have to see to realize that they were about to deal with the guards yet again. Sister Elaine limped forward and was hoisted up as well. The trio of males then had to decide what to do with their prisoners when several guard faces peered down into the hole. Oi! She's telling the truth! Give us a hand, men! said the guard commander. Cabe and Fargus escorted each of the bandits to the access port and handed them off to the guards above. Welby kept a close watch on their rear, and Scotty the dog. With all of the prisoners accounted for, Cabe scaled the tunnel and popped up to dry ground. Fargus lifted Welby and the dog up and quickly followed. As he exited, he noticed that a crowd had gathered with a mixture of guards as well. A portly man, dressed in what appeared to be ceremonial armor, pushed his way through the crowd, and several guardsmen demanded to know what was going on. His anger lessened when he noticed that Sister Elaine was badly injured and called for someone to get her help. The older commander folded his arms onto his large stomach and explained that he wanted answers immediately. Fargus began to explain, but was cut short by Cabe Silvertongue, who insisted that he explain. The colorful bard then retold the tale of delving into the sewers to recover a poor, lost and scared dog with a face that no one could refuse. His storytelling had become rather impressive and the audience seemed to hang on every word. As his embellished tale was told, there were no interruptions except for some well-placed cheers by the crowd who enjoyed the daring heroism, albeit enhanced account of the activities that occurred. As Cabe concluded the explanation the crowd cheered as he presented the nefarious individuals that had preyed upon the populace, who rolled their eyes at the account. While the commander looked unconvinced, he noted that the crowd was certainly not in his corner. As applause and backslapping slowed, the commander raised his hands for quiet. He complimented the group on a job well done, but pointed out that venturing into the sewers was still against the law and they would have to answer for their crime. A chorus of boos and jeers followed, and the smiles disappeared from the guards' faces. The man commander quickly amended his statement to include that they would be allowed to show up tomorrow where they would answer for their offense and receive their well-earned reward, which brought another hail of cheers from the crowd, which then began to disperse, chattering about the tale they had just heard. The commander waited for the crowd to leave and then pointed out that he would see the group tomorrow at noon in the Hall of Justice. His men took possession of Ioki, Dorwin, and Lothar and led them away promptly. The commander gave a curt nod to the adventurers and followed his men towards the gulag. Well, that was quite the tale, 
remarked Sister Elaine smugly. I missed the part about us solving the riddle of gold or creating the sun. The embarrassed bard smiled and pointed out that perhaps he had laid it on a bit thick, but quickly added that the people got what they wanted. The group nodded and clapped him on the back for his quick thinking. Lady Irena asked if they could get some rest now, as a trio of monks had arrived. The three healers had cleaned off the party's wounds and administered basic aid to the heroes before scurrying off. After finding their bearings, the group noticed that they were only two blocks away from their lodging. As they dragged their battered bodies down the street, several passers-by yelled out remarks as the tale of the sewer heroes was already spreading quickly. The group was gracious and continued to the Phoenix Inn, where they were nonchalantly greeted by the proprietor, who suggested that they wash off out back before going to their rooms. His lack of enthusiasm indicated that he had not yet heard the fantastic tale. After washing off as much grime as they could, the group filed back into the inn and went to their rooms. Sister Elaine joined Lady Irena for the night, as she did not want to trek to the temple. The members of the group quickly fell fast asleep, exhausted from the trials of the day. The next morning they arose well after sunrise, and each found out quickly that they were quite sore from the previous day's work. Moving down into the common room, they were surprised as the night clerk and day clerk quickly attended to their needs. Forcing other patrons out from a large table, the group was brought a large amount of food and drink, and both employees were being overly attentive. After several checks on the group, the two men finally went away, leaving them to themselves. <sighs> I guess he heard about our exploits, remarked a much healthier Sister Elaine. You really charmed the pants off the locals with that crap you spewed, she said, with her comment aimed at Cabe. He attempted to defend himself by pointing out that he hadn't lied, just embellished for the sake of a good story. He pointed out that both ladies looked far better than they had last night. Lady Irena confirmed that Sister Elaine used her healing powers this morning and explained that cleric spells are different from a mage's. The men nodded in acceptance and finished several plates of heaping food. They discussed their options and felt they could find the dog's owner, Mistress Aileen Vallon, before the time they were to meet at the Hall of Justice. The group agreed and attempted to pay for their meal, as it was far more than just a simple breakfast. The day innkeeper politely refused their efforts, pointing out that they had been a victim of Lothar, like many others. He was happy that the bully had been dealt with, and declined any attempt for the group to pay. Fargus shrugged his shoulders and shook the nervous man's hand and thanked him. Overcome with hero worship, the man smiled broadly, exposing several gaps in his teeth, but profusely thanked each member of the party. The group trudged back out into the bright street and looked at each other. Man, we look horrible, pointed out Welby O'Toole. We really need some new clothes. Each looked at the state of their attire and agreed, but Lady Arena quickly gave out the incantation that cleaned their clothes and eliminated the aroma that each one had given off. Shaking his head in approval, Cabe pointed out, nicely done. Well, he pulled forth the job notice and inquired as to the address to find Mistress Elaine. After several inquiries and getting noticed on the street, the party found themselves at her residence, a stately two-story home in the center of town. A butler answered the door and observed Scotty with the party. He had them wait just inside the door and looking at Welby, advised them not to touch anything. He then left to fetch the mistress. Well, he is pretty rude, pointed out Welby, as Sister Elaine smacked his hand that quickly found a trinket on a nearby table. Ow! I was just looking at it, he retorted. Look with your eyes, touch with your hands, Welby, the cleric responded. A few moments later, Elaine, Elaine appeared and Scotty quickly escaped the grasp of the party. The dog happily licked its owner and was equally overjoyed to see the pet. She promptly gave each of them thanks and asked Jinx to pay them the reward. She left the room to feed the dog as Jinx handed out the predetermined reward of five gold crowns 
but then quickly padded down the road to ensure that nothing had accidentally fallen into his pockets before quickly escorting the group out of the home. Well, that was quite rude, remarked Lady Irena angrily. Loby agreed and was scratching his forehead with a silver key, which was quickly noticed by the others. Where did you get that? spat out Sister Elaine, to which Welby shrugged his shoulders unknowingly. We close out this episode now and give you our thanks for listening. Please subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at The Bards Podcast. For everyone in Adventures at Philbar, thanks for listening.